right. Thanks to everybody who's already jumping in. Already got a pretty decent sized crowd. Hopefully that's just going to grow for the next several minutes. And as everybody comes in, just a heads up, I believe that we have moved on from last month's amateur hour where I was somehow had the settings to where nobody could chat. And we figured that out about halfway through the webinar. So everybody should be able to post a chat, post a Q and A, raise your hands, do all of those things. We had all of that stuff last, uh, last month. We just, people weren't able to chat. So that should be taken care of. All right, we've already got a pretty decent sized crowd and I'm sure that people are gonna be coming in more over the next several minutes, but I'll go ahead and jump into it. Welcome to my favorite lecture presented by Missouri Community College Association. I'm Cliff Judy. I'm the Director of uh, Professional Development and Member Engagement. I sometimes have to remember which comes first. It's such a long job title. Uh, for those who are new to the lecture series, this is an opportunity for us to feature some of our awesome educators from around the state. Um, when we say my favorite lecture, favorite is a very subjective word, right? This can mean anything from lectures that resonate especially well with um, our students or have the most helpful tips for life and for work or a discussion on um, issues that are especially relevant to higher education or especially relevant to the news cycle and so on and so on. This lecture um, takes on the last of those three that I just mentioned. We have literature professor Chris Otto from Jefferson College with us today. It's our first Jeffco lecturer for uh, my favorite lecture. So thank you to Professor Otto for, for joining us today. And um, to sort of set you up to tee Professor Otto off, October is National Book Month. And the American Library Association last month said that 2022 is expected to break last year's record for book bans and book restrictions. Already, we've seen 681 attempts uh, targeting more than 1,600 book titles. And uh, those book bans often disproportionately target books with either main characters or secondary characters who um, are marginalized, who are historically underrepresented, people of color, the LGBTQ community, just as a couple of examples. And you may know that Missouri just passed a new law making it a misdemeanor for K through 12 schools to give students um, sexually inappropriate or material that has sexually inappropriate or sexually explicit images. Um, all of this despite school officials and librarians saying that they already screen for sexually explicit material and age appropriate material. So with this being both National Book Month and the new law that just got enacted a month and a half ago, Professor Anato and I have been talking since the spring. And he said, with the new law coming in, he said, I, I really would like to switch up my plan of what I was going to present about. And I want to share my experience teaching banned books. And my perspective on why it's so important to expose students to challenging material like that. So with that, I will turn it over to Professor Otto. And uh, again, thank you very much for being here and for speaking with us. All right. Thank you for the introduction. And, I did forget uh, to mention one thing. I'm so sorry. We do always want for this to be a discussion. We want for this to be um, a, a place where people feel like they can engage back and forth with us. So anytime that you have a thought that you'd like to share with the group, throw it into the chat, throw it into the q and I promise the chat is working this month um, and I will be muting myself, uh, turning my camera off and I'm just gonna be monitoring the attendee list. So if you raise your hand or ask to come off of mute or anything like that, I'll be monitoring that. Uh, so please, turn this into a conversation with Professor Otto. We really appreciate it. All right, now I am officially going to step out of the way and let you do your thing, Professor. Okay, okay, thank you. I have to admit this is bringing back all kinds of uncomfortable memories from the COVID pandemic, um, where um, you're just sort of 
lecturing or speaking into the abyss. Uh, I will assume that all of the connections are appropriate and uh, you can hear me. Um, so I wanted to talk about um, the importance of banned books. We just celebrated banned books week um, not terribly long ago. I think that was in the middle of uh, the second half of September. Um, but, you know, um, Cliff did a fine job in sort of setting up the, the current um, situation. And so I am going to turn, um, you know, I'm going to just mention briefly, I think that he, you know, he mentioned this, but we're seeing an uptick and uh, there's a few things that are alarming about it. One is the sort of uh, prolif uh, proliferation of these advocacy groups that are kind of pushing a particular agenda and they're passing around uh, titles. Now, um, I've never experienced any kind of uh, pushback in any of the teaching that I've done, but of course, um, any book that you may choose to uh, teach in a course may have been uh, challenged or banned at some point um, in its lifetime. So I kind of think of this um, as kind of a, my love letter to um, literature, and um, it was really a pleasure to kind of um, go through the, you know, the, the Rolodex of the mind and think about the books that I've had the um, chance to teach over the course of my career. But I thought that um, I would begin just sort of um, talking more about myself. Um, and the reason why I am where I'm at right now is because books changed my life. Um, when I took a World Lit class in college, um, after that experience, I changed my major. My major. I was going to uh, political science. I thought I would go to law school, and um, became an English major. And specifically, I found that I had to unlearn several stereotypes and biases that I had that had been imprinted into my mind, just based on my <clears throat> my community. Uh, my, you know, where I grew up and where I went to school. So I'm not proud to say um, it at all, but when I uh, went away to school, I, I was rather um, sheltered when it came um, to issues of race and gender and sexual orientation. And so I had all probably the worst kind of stereotypes. And so I know that the experience of reading and the experiencing of meeting people had a life-altering um, experience for me, and that the uh, um, books um, and the classes that I took in my and devoting my life to uh, teaching English has not only made my own life richer, but I hope it has made the lives of my students richer as well. And in particular, um, I think that um, great works of literature illustrate. Um, you know, grace and forgiveness and tolerance, which again um, were things that I needed to um, really address, especially at the age of 18 uh, years old, uh, 19 years old, going into um, adulthood. So some of the book, banned books that I have taught um, should be showing up on your screen. Um, and I just picked a, a selection. I hope it's not too many. I, don't worry, I'm not going to launch into like a really long speech on every single text, but I just wanted to hit um, a little highlight. And um, in particular, I wanted to share with you kind of the context that I teach each uh, work and perhaps some of the reactions that I've had from students or some particularly memorable uh, discussions or just some ideas that, um, that emanated from, uh, from teaching these, these works. And so the first one that I would uh, mention is The Sorrows of, of Young Werther. And, and it's, it's not ironic, I, I suppose it's um, apropos that this is one of the books that was in that first World Lit class that I took back in, you know, 1989. Um, 
And I teach it, I just recently taught it to a group of students that we took to Germany in 2019. And um, it's a short book and it's a, it's an epistolary uh, novel uh, made up of, um, you know, Werther's uh, letters back to his best friend. And he's kind of traveling, he's an artist, he wants to move out to the country. And of course he falls in love and uh, he falls in love with Lot, who is, um, you know, she's got a fiance. So she's um, sort of, you know, forbidden, you know, um, she's spoken for. What my students, um, first of all, not all of them like it, of course, right? Uh, but what the students are able to really pick up on is that um, uh, Werther in this um, novel, it, it's not even that he's so much in love with Lot. It's that he's in, he's in love with the idealized version of love. And not only that, but they're quite um, um, astute observers in analyzing his behavior. They're able to identify um, symptoms of depression symptoms of bipolar um, depression. They notice how extreme um, he feels everything. And I think that this is one of the um, powers uh, that literature has that um, maybe you may not have experienced something like this. Um, in the end, of course, he commits suicide because he can't have the woman or because he's sort of descent into, he's descended into this mental um, state. Um, and, and this is one of the first books that really gets people riled up because all over, all over Europe, there's um, supposedly sprouting up these Werther groups where men dress up like him and they pledge their love. And there are rumors that people did copycat suicide. So the Werther effect comes from uh, you know, this book, but any, the research I've done suggests that there weren't like mass outbreaks of uh, suicide. Um, but it does, um, it does sort of speak to this idea that some texts are dangerous. And there was a, a great deal of um, questioning, can you know, um, can you read too much? and be so lost in the world of literature that you have a hard time distinguishing fantasy and reality. My, I think my students also can recognize that aspect in their own lives as well if you just replace books with cell phones or TikTok or uh, social media. Um, one of the things that we do talk about uh, in this book as well is um, just how difficult managing your emotions can be and, and is, um, especially in you know if you're suffering from uh, mental illness. So I think that this this um, is the first book. Um, as I said, most of my students in the German lit class they didn't like it as much, but they did point those things out, and we did visit uh, his home, uh, Goethe's home in Frankfurt. I've taught Mary Shelley in a variety of uh, settings. R right now I'm teaching it in like a literary, it's a, a, a literary appreciation course. And um, it's, um, the theme is uh, monsters. And so um, the first thing that my students are really interested in is that um, the monster is not Frankenstein. It's very, I think it's fascinating that how those two have sort of melded um, into one. Um, but this is a book I think that asks us to reflect on our own fears. Um, and we can look at it from a variety of perspectives. Sometimes my students uh, will bring up, well, we can't predict the consequences of you know, certain types of research or um, innovation. Um, they also seem to recognize the role that compassion could play in placating um, the monster. They're obviously Victor Frankenstein's sort of um, abdication of his parental, you know, responsibilities um, brings up larger issues about responsibilities, you know, to outsiders or people who are different 
and in particular people who perhaps look different because uh, most of the monster's interactions with other people are colored by his deformity and his, his, uh, um, his physical presence. Uh, my students find it interesting how Franken as a Franken as a um, prefix has kind of entered into the um, popular lexicon. And I also try to bring out um, at the heart of Dr. Frankenstein's agenda is kind of an attempt to defeat nature, to um, create life um, uh, as, a, as a man right? and, and in, in a way that um, is oftentimes referred to as playing God and uh, what kinds of restrictions or limits should there be. And our, my students do a good job of, of kind of pointing out that one thing that um, could benefit Victor, you know, Frankenstein is a little bit of humility. Um, the other thing is, is that they're so used to the movies, uh, Frankenstein, that they're not expecting this, um, this figure that inspires so much pathos and sympathy, right? I'm, I am malicious because I am miserable. Am I not shunned and hated by all mankind? Lots of students find their way into this novel because they feel like they've been shunned or estranged and oftentimes because of appearance or something that makes them kind of stand out. Um, and so um, I've really enjoyed teaching um, that text as well. I, I sometimes, I, I have been recently teaching the communist manifestos included in our comp to uh, at least most of it, almost all of it is. And um, there, the, the fascinating thing it, to, to discuss with students is how many things that they think that Karl Marx really kind of got right. And then they like to talk about the things that they think that uh, Marx um, got wrong. But again, this is um, a kind of a, a nice an example of one of those dangerous ideas that um, really colored, you know, the Red Scare and um, really um, influenced things like uh, McCarthyism. And my goal, obviously, is not to push a particular agenda one way or the other, but to be able to model how to have intelligent discussions and how to debate issues and how to, um, you know, analyze uh, particular arguments. And so um, I think that my students are capable of some, some degree of, of analysis and understanding of the idea that the, the ruling ideas are the ideas of the ruling class. Uh, we do spend several days, you know, kind of um, passing this, um, this text around. Um, they do like to talk about kind of the inherent crisis um, that capitalism can cause, especially in terms of its boom and bust cycles, also the subjugation of uh, natural forces, you know, to, the, to man's desire for, uh, pro, uh, for profit. They're not ready to um, relinquish their private property, um, and they disagree with Marks on his ideas of on family and religion um, as well. However, um, I think that the uh, exposure to the text again goes a long way to um, um, to kind of producing the type of, of people that we hope to uh, live and work with. Um, I taught um, selections from Leaves of Grass. Um, when I taught American literature, and um, I love to talk about, you know, I mean, what can, Walt Whitman? I mean, uh, if you're not if you're not crazy about Walt, you know, what's up? Um, I I am particularly enjoy the challenge of teaching Song of Myself. I like the first version. Um, the first, first edition, but uh, because it's such a celebration of the individual for all of its, for all of the individual's 
quirks and idiosyncrasies, you know, idiosyncrasies. Of course, you know, we are aware of the um, charges of, you know, homoeroticism and obscenity that followed this uh, particular text. Um, I enjoy asking my students to really zero in on those passages that they think would have ruffled the feathers of readers in the 1850s, and they are amazed at how benign <laughs> that they truly are. But um, in an American literature class, I think that um, this leaves uh, the uh, song of myself is really an apt metaphor for the idea of America itself just as the speaker in the poem um, sort of is imagining himself as this expanding self to include all different walks of life and absorbs all different types of experiences. And then he comes back to himself and discovers that he contains multitudes. It's, it's, um, it is kind of the hopeful, optimistic idea of an American democracy and students like parts of it, they don't like parts of it. Um, they tend to kind of think that Whitman is a bit naive in his hopefulness and his um, positivity. Um, and, and maybe he was. Um, but I can't think of a better sort of metaphor, I think, for America than this idea of this shared experience and that I'm, you know, I am you and, and you are, are, are me as well. Um, and, and just the idea of, you know, his language and his, you know, his picture in the frontispiece here where he's the Western hat and the arm akimbo and he's a, he's a man of, of, of labor. He's not an aristocrat. Um, and, um, I love teaching uh, the work, and of course, it has its own checkered uh, past in terms of people finding it too obscene, and and maybe that's the real obscenity. Again, from uh, um, the American literature class, when I taught it, that's the second half. I would oftentimes teach uh, Huckleberry Finn, and I have kind of selfish reasons for that. There are passages, I really, as a young kid, when I read the book, I found myself, um, I, I could understand much of Huck um, in terms of his biography. He had an alcoholic father and had to take the kind of geographic uh, route to deal with that. He had to kind of, you know, this fleeing. Huck is... You know, he's unlettered, he's uncouth, he's, you know, sort of disrespectful, I guess, but he has this very, very gentle heart. I think that he is in many ways, um, he's afraid of, you know, violence. Um, I love the idea of using this outsider uh, character to comment on the hypocrisy of uh, religion and uh, you know culture and um, feuds and um, you know not only that but his sort of forming this impromptu kind of family with uh, Jim and this book really resonated me with me because you see a young boy who's struggling with his conscience he's trying to figure out um, really should he embrace the kind of racism of his time and his culture, or should he follow his heart, which has been, um, you know, redeemed, I suppose, by the personal experience that he has with um, Jim. Now, I mean, I understand that, you know, Huck Finn has been attacked on both sides, the right and from the right and the left. And um, I think that that's a useful discussion to have in a class. Um, I wish that Twain hadn't relied so heavily on the sort of minstrel depiction of Jim's character. There are times when I, I feel like Twain is playing with Jim. And that, of course, is a, is a violation. 
Now, I, do I think the book should be banned? No, uh, I don't think it should be banned. I don't think it should be required either, but I don't think that that's the uh, right approach. I think that the, um, the ideas um, present offer us a jumping off point for having uh, discussions about race and about um, slavery that are useful and can be informed by the text and can, um, again, kind of instill in readers um, a bit of humility, a bit of, of grace. And um, by watching this boy, by watching Huck's evolution, um, his conscious, as, it, as his consciousness evolves on this issue, I think that we can have uh, really productive um, discussions. Um, And of course, all right, then I'll go to hell. I mean, that's sort of the seminal moment um, in the text when he decides that he's going to help. He's going to help Jim rather than send him out, uh, sell him out. Um, I taught the awakening in a literary, in a short novel uh, class. It's all these, you know, novellas essentially. And I find that. Um, Students don't, a lot of students struggle with Edna uh, Pontellier and they aren't sure about her, you know, relationships and her sex outside of marriage. Um, but there's one scene in this uh, book that kind of takes place a little bit earlier. And this is when her husband comes back from the casino and Edna's asleep and he wants to talk to her. He wants to um, kind of gossip about, you know, the card game. And so the husband, you know, she won't wake up and she's asleep. And so he's trying to get her to wake up. And so then he says, oh, I think our son has a fever. And if you don't go check on him, you know, you're a bad uh, mother. And so then she wakes up, she springs to action. And she goes to check on him. And of course, he's um, fine. And what's interesting then is uh, her husband then is just kind of sitting back, uh, sitting out on the porch and he's smoking the cigar. And students notice that and they uh, like to talk about it. Um, in, terms of, in terms of what is it that um, Edna is awakening to, right? And so I'll pose that question and this little, this little vignette suggests that she's awakening to the sort of oppression that is um, present in a patriarchal um, society within this kind of version of, um, of marriage. And always my non-traditional students um, uh, find a, a more mature, uh, you know, of course they do, um, take on um, this particular um, novel um, I like to talk about um, the title as well in terms of what does she awake to, what does she awake from. You get a variety of different um, types of answers. And then I also try to link it to this idea of, of being woke. And are those similar in some way? Are they different? How is the word woke being used? Who decides what it means? What are the power dynamics that are um, sort of at play? But I think that the book um, and what I really like to um, highlight is Edna's spiritual awakening through her body, through her friends, through her art, through her time in nature, and through her mind. Um, the, the passages we tend to really sort of power over are those um, depictions when she's out swimming, you know, in the sea. And um, overall, I think that the students um, find the work to be uh, compelling. They find the depiction of marriage. Well, one thing that they, a lot of them, a lot of students will say is, man, that was really bad back then. And so then you kind of follow up, well, is this just a window into the past or is there any kind of relevance? And of course, that, that, that leads to uh, more discussions about, you know, the state of marriage today, the um, um, domestic, you know, violence, the, um, the longing for freedom within a marriage. 
and what does it mean to be uh, a woman? This morning on NPR, I was listening to a story about even in families where the uh, man is the primary, uh, even when he earns less than the woman, the woman's the, the, the still does the bulk of all the domestic um, uh, work, the cleaning and the, um, the laundry, etc. So the challenge is to find avenues to connect Edna's story with the um, with the contemporary world, because a, a lot of times our students, or my students, will want to just sort of say, "Well, that's." That was bad for her, but I'm glad things are different now. I couldn't really find if this book was actually banned, I'll be honest. Um, however, I, I, it was roundly uh, disliked, I'll just put it that way, in the uh, critical uh, circles. And I think the fact that it largely disappeared for whatever, 60, years or so and then was rediscovered as you know with this second wave or the feminist wave in the uh, 60s i think that that um, in a sense is a type of banishment by ignoring which is um also terrible The eyes of uh, the eyes are watching. Uh, their eyes were watching God. Um, what is important? I think what I try to highlight to my students, um, of course, Richard Wright didn't like the fact that Zora Neale Hurston's book didn't address more um, strongly the um, the struggle for civil rights, which I kind of. I'm not sure if that's a really great argument. And that he sort of critiques her for um, really focusing on the sensual and love. And um, I'm not sure if Richard Wright was, was, had a very good argument in that case. Um, what comes out from this book is another woman who, you know, a series of marriages and her quest to find love and it's a nice sort of counterpart to the awakening in the sense that she's struggling to find an identity not shaped by her, um, you know, her relationships. She too has to, in a sense, cut ties a little bit with her past. Her, her grandmother sort of suggests that she should strive for stability in a heteronormative uh, domestic life. Um, and it's a shame that the book has been attacked and censored and banned because I, what, what comes out to me and what I think my students pick up is that everyone is deserving of love and everyone kind of takes their own interesting um, you know, journey. So we are all worthy of love. Um, Janie Crawford's character um, is free to choose who she wants to love. And that's very different from her uh, grandmother. And um, I think that this particular text also reveals how the um, experience of the character is really the best teacher that you can't you can't always trust what your elders want for you or the map that they set out for you. Um, I think that the, the novel is remarkable in its depiction of um, perseverance and grit and not giving in or throwing in the towel when things could be, um, couldn't be much difficult, could, much more difficult. And, um, a lot of, again, many of my non-traditional students find this story to be quite uh, relevant in their own lives, especially if they've had um, failed uh, marriages. I've had a chance, I, I didn't even think that, I, I sort of debated whether or not to teach Fahrenheit 451, because I just assumed everyone um, had it in high school. 
And so I just took a poll. I taught a science fiction class a few years ago, and I thought, well, if you haven't, you know, this would be one that, you know, you really should go back and uh, look at. And I get it. It's a high school book. Um, but I don't think that that detracts from any, um, detracts from the power of the uh, story at all. The thing that my students are fascinated by is they find it to be the ultimate absurdity that a book about book burning has been banned and challenged. Um, they can't wrap their minds around that. They're also may, amazed by how prescient Ray, Ray Bradbury actually was in his sort of anticipation of our current technological um, world. And, um, you know, you recall there are the, these panels on the walls that sort of um, broadcast these kind of uh, soap opera type of TV shows. Everyone is sort of self-medicating uh, um, to the point of being comatose. Um, I have a couple of quotes here from, uh, you know, no one listens anymore. I can't talk to the walls because they're yelling at me. These big TVs and this, you know, reality TV. And then in her ears, the little seashells, the thimble radios tamp tight on the electronic ocean sound. I was thinking about how all my students uh, walk around with those little earbuds. And again, I think Ray Bradbury somehow uh, had a crystal ball and was able to see so many of these things uh, take place. I think that the, the, the wider sort of message or the, the bigger um, point that I oftentimes like to really highlight with my students is that this is um, the world that Bradbury describes is kind of a function of complacency and people being <clears throat> lulled into a state of apathy by technology and by, um, um, you know, drugs. Um, the um, what happens as a result of that is an extinction of, of independent uh, thinking and, and individuality. Technology is, is clearly misused to placate um, the characters in this uh, particular uh, story. And so um, my students like to discuss um, Montag's sort of awakening, as it were, from being a, a fire, fireman to one who joins the struggle. They find his character to be compelling because, you know, he's flawed and he's sort of hiding books and he's kind of curious. And um, I think that, you know, as I said, I, 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 I wouldn't have normally thought about uh, teaching it, but I made reference to it a number of times in a science fiction class. And so um, most of the students had not read it. And perhaps um that's also kind of sad you know as i was putting this together i was reflecting on these great books that i've had the chance to teach over the course of years and i was also kind of saddened by the fact that most of our literature classes now are online many of them uh, don't you know meet the threshold for a face-to-face -face class and <coughs> excuse me as someone who has, you know, devoted his life to this, I, that's very disheartening. And I think that Bradbury's novel in many ways addresses that. Um, I just have a couple of more um, examples here. Um, in American literature, I would always teach Howell. I would always include a supermarket in California and draw parallels between um, Walt Whitman. Of course, there are a lot of things that aren't the same. Um, but um, Howell is sort of a personal vision. It's, it breaks the rules. It was a challenging text for people in 1957. It has this kind of drug-induced, hallucinatory style um, but ultimately, my students come to see it as a type of protest against the forces of conformity in the 1950s. And um, I like to sort of point out that as, as Ginsburg is kind of breaking poetry open, in a sense, there are other artists at that time period as well, like Ornette Coleman and Miles Davis and Lenny Bruce. 
and some of the um, uh, visual artists as well, breaking free from the uh, tradition that came before, kind of a, a breaking free of the rules. And this is such a, a uniquely American thing uh, that the youth is constantly determined to reinvent itself in terms and in language and in styles that are repugnant to their elders. And while many people might find that to be threatening and scary and disorienting, I think that we can, we can if we want there to be this healthy intellectual and artistic culture, we have to welcome it, we have to embrace it, we have to um, be willing to um, be tolerant. Um, not only those issues, but also this poem in many ways is Ginsburg coming to terms with his own identity as a gay man. Um, at the time, uh, homosexuality, our students are, are puzzled and uh, are surprised to learn that at the time um, this was considered an illness and in many states, including uh, Missouri, that um, this was punishable as a crime. Um, his lifestyle and his um, sexual uh, orientation. It's a great book to talk about free speech and obscenity, and it's one you know victory for free speech in the sense that the judge in the trial said that the work did have artistic um, value, and. Um, I don't know if it would get the same kind of reading today, but I think that that is uh, um, illustrative for our students to see how the system played out, how was obscenity um, um, considered. Um, I think that the other thing that really resonated, especially um, a few years prior when we were in Afghanistan and we had lots of students coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan is that this biblical monster Moloch is really kind of this military industrial, you know, meat grinder and it's the God of child sacrifice. So um, there's so much in the poem uh, that the students don't really like, but there are enough jewels in it that um, we can really have a productive um, discussion. I think that um, as I approach the text and, and, and teach it, I try to um, come at the text from a celebratory position that it's, um, it's encouraging, it's important, it's a sign of a tolerant democratic society that we can include the people who are outside the mainstream, the people who are um, uh, marginalized and again, um, <laughs> we can draw a line all the way back to Huck Finn that uh, he points out so much of the national hypocrisy that people um, ex just sort of generally accept. All right, I hope I'm not totally boring you. I hope you're not completely asleep or you've wandered off, but I just have a couple of more, um, two more examples and then um, just like a closing thought. So I hope that you can hang in there. Um, I know I'm, I'm, I've almost put myself to sleep listening to my voice <laughs> drag on, but I had a chance to teach a Native American literature class. I included ceremony, and I love the structure of this novel. I love the story of uh, Teo, who's a half uh, Navajo, half white person. He doesn't doesn't feel like he fits in. There's even some question as to whether or not he can partake in the traditional ceremonies. But I love the way the book is sort of interspersed with flashbacks and then it also weaves in traditional um, stories and mythology. And um, in the upper right pass um, sort of section of the screen, I love this idea I will tell you something about stories. They aren't just entertainment. Don't be fooled. They are all we have. All we have to fight off illness and death. You don't have anything if you don't have stories. And we spend time talking about that. We spend time talking about um, being mixed race. We talk about alcoholism 
we talk about attempts to, you know, how do people cope with uh, post-traumatic stress because Teo's coming back from uh, World War II. They join the Marines, he and his, I think it's his cousin, to, because they want to become Americans, but then when the war is over, they realize that they're still not Americans. So uh, we can have discussions about colonization. We can have discussions about PTSD. We can have um, discussions about the kind of violence of in, uh, Native American removal, the internalized violence that Native Americans have absorbed. But this book um, kind of gives us, um, it ends with this much more optimistic and hopeful note that returning to one's sort of cultural heritage um, and that heritage, by the way, is not static. It has to change and evolve. But returning to that is a site of healing and a place to address the trauma of colonization and of warfare and of um, isolation. And so, um, again, uh, uh, we have another character uh, in this instance who is dealing with uh, trauma we have a marginalized voice. And ultimately we have, uh, the, I think that the thing that emanates at the end is that this, this power and realization of the interconnectedness of all things. Um, so I love the book. Sometimes my students find the structure to be challenging, um, but it does lead to interesting um, conversations. And so now I um, conclude the examples uh, with uh, Margaret Atwood's uh, The Handmaid's Tale, um, the 1985 dystopian um, novel depicting um, the reduction of women to reproductive slavery, the uh, Christian nationalist nation of the Republic of Gilead, the, um, the backdrop of the toxic environment and the loss of uh, fertility. And um, I point out to the students that Margaret Atwood was writing speculative fiction and everything in her book, she found a contemporary correlative to. So, you know, we think about the 80s and the election of Reagan the embracing of conservatism, the ascendancy of groups such as the moral majority, focus on the family, <coughs> um, and again, how prescient, uh, you know, really was she? We hear talk on some fringe media about Christian nationalism. This book is um, asks the question: What if? And what are you doing or what could happen if there aren't appropriate checks in place? Um, of course, the, the Hulu series has also gone a, a long way to um, spreading and to highlighting the uh, Atwood's um, novel. And um, I think that, you know, in light of the Dobbs decision, um, a discussion about um, abortion. It's, it's such an interesting time because it's 2022. And as a kid in the 80s, I thought, oh, man, we're going to have flying cars and we'll have all this stuff figured out. We're still talking about race. We're still talking about a woman's right to bodily autonomy. And we're still talking about um, the dangers of authoritarianism and, and book banning or book uh, burning. And I hope we keep um, talking about them. Um, and uh, I know that my uh, students like to um, find those connections between what's happening in the debate surrounding um, abortion and the forced um, childbirth that the Offred and her uh, fellow characters are um, subjected to. So, um, and then I just like this, the, someone made a fireproof copy of the book and they 
auctioned it off and donated the money to Pan America to fight book banning. I just like that image of Margaret Atwood with that flamethrower and um, the book not burning. So, Professor Otto, I apologize um, for I jumping in on you. Professor Otto, I apologize for jumping in on you, but we had a uh, question in the chat uh, specifically uh, that sort of goes towards Handmaid's Tale and books like it. Do you see the role of the college literature professor to be different than that of a high school English teacher? If so, do you believe there are some books that are not appropriate for high school students? For example, the graphic novel version of The Handmaid's Tale contains explicit sexual content. I do not. Because I do not find there to, I mean, they may have different, the college and the high school may have different sort of a, um, slightly different approaches to teaching. I do not think that that is inappropriate for high school students because um, first of all, they're carrying around cell phones and they've seen it. And I don't think that, um, now again, if students choose to opt out, that's their choice. But I tend to trust um, my high school students. If you give them um, access to a text and you discuss it and you are open and frank about it, um, I don't think that that's anything that they haven't seen, heard, or been exposed to before. I also don't think that the imagery is in any way going to damage or harm them. I think that, um, again, if a, per a parent doesn't want to um, have their student read it, that's fine. But I can't, uh, can't pretend like um, teenagers are not, have not seen naked bodies or have not seen depictions of sex um, because they walk around with their um, cell phones. And so I am not for pulling back on that um, at all. I don't know, I don't think, if it was up to me, I don't think I would use the graphic novel version, read the book. Um, and the, you know, the picture, the, the comic book version, you know, use that on your own time. I hope that that's a, a fair answer uh, to your question. But thank you for the question. And I'd love to discuss it further with you. Um, I teach these books because they encourage us to confront our fears, because they pose questions like why, and what would I do, and what if, because they make us question our beliefs. I teach these books because they make us uncomfortable. You should be uncomfortable sometimes. Some things aren't going to be pleasant. And this is a good um, place to develop that capacity. I teach banned books because I like uh, those who take chances and break the rules. I teach banned books because they show us our flaws. They show us how to be more humble and how to understand. They allow us to enter the emotional world of another person, which was important for me. They remind us that we're not alone. They remind us that we all deserve love. And so on that note, I will conclude this presentation and um, I would be welcome or I would love to have any questions or comments or thoughts. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Professor Otto. Um, if anybody is interested in uh, throwing out another question, just throw it into the chat. We also have the Q&A feature, um, or you can raise your hands, ask to go off of mute. I've got that list up here right in front of me if anybody ends up doing that. Um, if there are no questions or further discussions, um, I will keep monitoring this right now. Um, I do just want to say another big and very hearty thank you to Professor Otto from Jefferson College for joining us today. Um, that was, um, I think, really important, especially considering the developments in our state and the developments that are happening right now all around the country. Um, it's an incredible number of book bans and book restrictions that are being attempted right now. And Professor Otto and I were discussing just yesterday, um, in past years, not necessarily in 2021, 21, but in past movements like this, this was generally the kind of thing where an individual parent or a small group 
were trying to make things happen. This is a very, very organized effort right now by organized groups. Um, so we are in a different stage right now of, of attempting to restrict um, uh, uh, library resources or attempting to ban books. Um, so incredibly, um, incredible, incredibly important topic. And uh, Professor Otto, I don't know if you're checking out the chats right now, but you're um, getting a lot of props from your colleagues right now. Um, uh, thank you to Hannah. She said, absolutely great list of banned books that we should read. They're supposed to make us uncomfortable because real life is uncomfortable, whether we like it or not. Um, we are going to be posting this on YouTube. Um, Professor Otto, I hadn't talked to this you about this yet, but we'll also ask you for your slides just so we can share it with all the people who, um, all of the people who joined us today. And perhaps I can solicit from you a list of banned books that you've taught either in your classes or that you recommend, and we can send it out to everybody. Um, Great. Thank you very much. Um, so. So everybody is aware, my favorite lecture is a monthly lecture series that we usually do on the second Tuesday of the month. Next month, that would be on election day. So we're probably going to move that to avoid um, any complications there. And um, a couple of quick MCCA announcements. In a couple of weeks, we will do another webinar. We've got a note coming out on that very soon. It's not going to be part of the My Favorite Lecture series. This is going to be a webinar from our friends at St. Charles Community College. They're going to detail over how over the past 18 months they have launched what's called a Men of Color Student Success Program. It's a program specifically designed to promote student success for male students of color as they transition from high school to college. And I'm doing a little bit of an informal uh, poll among the colleges to see how many of them have uh, programs like this. And um, I believe it's going to be a very small number of colleges. So if you're involved in a student affairs type area or an advisor type area, and this is something that you've wanted to get off of the ground, maybe this would be extremely helpful to you. So I will go ahead and put the link to register for that right here. Also, if you have not registered yet for the MCCA convention in late November, we're gonna be at Union Station in St. Louis and now is the time to get yourself registered. We are already at more than 340 registrants with a month and a half to go. Last year, it was more like 430. So with a month and a half to go, we're coming right up on what our numbers were last year. And hopefully we're gonna break some records of our own this year. Um, we get to this time of year and registrations really start to ramp up. I mentioned that because hotel reservations also start to ramp up and you want to make sure that you're able to lock in that really, really affordable discounted hotel rate that we've negotiated with Union Station. So I will also throw the registration link for the MCCA convention in there. Um, again, I'm taking a look at the chat over here and you're just getting a whole lot of props, uh, Professor Otto. So I want to say thank you one last time for joining us for doing this. Um, that was really fascinating. I went into it thinking that I was going to recognize most, if not all of the titles that you put out there. And yeah, I recognize a lot of them, but I also learned a whole lot more about a whole lot of other titles that I think that I need to go and check out now. So Thank you so much for joining us for my favorite lecture. Our first contribution from Jefferson College. Hopefully we're gonna get all of the colleges in here at some point. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. All right, have a great rest of your day, everybody. I hope you enjoyed yourself. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Bye. Thank you.